2001. Could we have the roll call, please? Chairman Sukayata? Here. Councilor Berry? Here. Councilor Carson? Here. Councilor Fritz? Here. Councilor Lynch? Hmm. Here. Councilor McGinty? Here. And Councilor Roberts? Here. Pledge of Allegiance? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is the chairman going to sing the national anthem? I'm glad we don't have to do that. <laughs> do we have any reports or correspondence from anyone on the council? Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Councilor McGinney and I uh, uh, met uh, with some uh, county officials, and uh, we're going to uh, look into that, that better with an idea to the up upcoming budget, but it will take much more than uh, a, a short meeting tonight. So uh, okay. Okay. we'll schedule uh, future meetings on that. Okay. We'd like to work with them. We have some uh, information we've put together which we'll share with the council and the people. At the end of this meeting, we're just going to be scheduling some, some dates for our calendars, so... Perhaps we can talk about it then. Fine. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to report? Any correspondence? No? Okay. The town manager's report. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. A couple of very brief items. Uh, the long-awaited demolition of the public safety building is now underway. <laughs> if anyone looked at it today, the old police station is no longer. Uh, so our hope is that the rest of the building will be uh, torn down. Uh, this coming week, as soon as they remove uh, the old doors that are being salvaged on the front. The fire department this last month has moved into the new facility. It's working very, very well. There's a punch list, again, still to be done, but it, it has been nice to see them uh, relocated into the, the new building, and it, it is working very, very well. I uh, did want to mention and thank the Family Fun Day Committee for the uh, very successful Family Fun Day. Uh, this past month that occurred. Uh, I was away, but I've heard nothing but good reports. There was no thunderstorm this year during it. <laughs> and finally, uh, within the last month or so, Sergeant Richard Lindsay of the police department celebrated his 30th anniversary as a police officer for the town of Cape Elizabeth. And, wow. uh, you know, it's very unusual for anyone to stay in a police department for 30 years, and, uh, but it's perfectly understandable, according to Sergeant Lindsay, when we don't have decent health insurance for retirees. And, uh, <laughs> He's told me that once. He's told me a hundred times, and you know, obviously, we don't provide that coverage. But uh, we really appreciate Dick's uh, dedication to the community and uh, his willingness to stick with us through the long term, and uh, just to be a, a very good police officer, a very good person serving the community. So, I know you'll join me in congratulating Sergeant Lindsay uh, on his first 30 years of uh, service <laughs> to the town. Is that it? That's it. <clears throat> okay. Um, citizens discussion of items not on the agenda is there anyone out there no nope I guess that's it all right the minutes everyone reviewed them from last time so your motion yeah, I move approval of the minutes of the June 11 2001 meeting second it's been moved and seconded all those in favor 7-0 Next, we have a presentation from our State Secretary of State, Dan Gwadowski, and Deborah Lane is going to tell us about his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce the Honorable Secretary of State, Dan Gwadowski. He is here with us this evening to unveil the rapid renewal program to not only the town council members but residents of Cape Elizabeth. The definition of rapid renewal is it's an online motor vehicle re-registration program and the secretary will get into a little bit more detail on that in his presentation. If the council recalls last year one of your goals was to enhance and promote the town's website and for also for town departments to look into potential transactions online. The pilot program for rapid renewal um, has involved 10 main communities. And the town manager, myself, and members of the tax office have been monitor monitoring that pilot program. 
That program uh, is and was a success, and the program has now been released to all Maine communities. It is my understanding this evening that we are uh, the 13th community, which I'm going to take that as a lucky number, um, to go online, hopefully with the Council's blessing this evening, um, to go forth with rapid renewal. Cape Elizabeth has completed its beta testing, whereby several residents who had June registrations last month, uh, they completed their re-registration online. They were able to use uh, a Visa MasterCard or um, a check. What you do is you put in your routing numbers from your check. So we have opted uh, to go for either um, form of payment for our residents. We understand that the success of rapid renewal is, also includes a promotion of rapid renewal. We will be assisted by the Secretary of State's office in notification to our residents, and again, I believe the Secretary will go into that a little bit. Um, the ease of accessing the website is important, so I've been working with Wendy Derzewick, who is our um, webmaster. There is a link, actually it's there right now, um, to the Rapid Renewal site from our website. This also, I think, ties in with the Town Council goal to enhance and promote our website. So folks going on to find Rapid Renewal will also find news of the day and other uh, things that we offer on our website. And then certainly you could access the website directly from the State of Maine website as well. We have asked for the assistance and been granted assistance from, of course, the Cape Courier. They will be helping us with some articles. Um, and also when folks call into the tax office asking for how late are you open? I need to re-register. We also certainly will be reminding them or informing them of this new service um, that we have available. So at this point, um, I'd like to thank Secretary Godosky for his leadership uh, for this era of new opportunities through technology. I think that it's really the first step of many as we um, go into more of e-government and e-commerce. I'd also at this time would be remiss if I did not thank the Secretary and certainly members of his staff uh, for his efforts and commitment for the conduction of elections in Maine. Um, through Secretary Godosky's leadership, Maine continues to hold up our electoral process to ensure fair elections. And for that, myself as a local election official, I certainly appreciate that and uh, enjoy working with the secretary and his staff. He's got a wonderful staff. They keep us um, abreast of everything that goes on with elections. And again, their information filtering down from us makes us at the local level look really great and we have successful elections. So I would like to thank you for that, Secretary Wadowski. We, we do appreciate that. Joining the Secretary this evening are a couple of other representatives from the Secretary of State's office. This is Domna Giatis and John Smith. Also joining us is my friend Shay Robbins. She is from Inform Maine. We've become very close over the last few weeks. Inform Maine is the link, if you will, between motor vehicles and the communities for the rapid renewal program. And I believe that you, uh, the brochure that you received in your town council packet talks a little bit more about that. So at this time, I won't take up any more time, um, but I do uh, welcome the council to ask any questions they may have of these folks here this evening. And again, your first agenda item is to act upon uh, Cape Elizabeth um, going into the rapid renewal program. So at this time, Secretary Godosky, I'd like to turn the podium to you. Thank you very much for those kind words, uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the council. Delighted uh, to be here. Thank you for being here. some uh, acquaintances that I haven't had a chance to see for a while and uh, catch up with you all. It's a fabulous building. should be very proud of the facility. Um, delighted to be here with my good friend, your town manager, who I've known for some time. And uh, you have one of, the, one of the outstanding town managers, certainly in the state. And for Deb, who I've had the chance to, in, to work with in a variety of election capacities, Deb is really the standard, the model we use for election clerks and officials across the state. And I know what uh, leadership and uh, she's provided to others over the years. And so delighted to renew uh, friendship again and continue to work with this. Uh, and very excited to be here today to help launch, uh, pending your final approval, uh, this new service on behalf of uh, our mutual constituents, the residents of Cape Elizabeth. And uh, in just a moment, I'll be showing you kind of a demo to show you uh, how this process works. Uh, as Deb indicated, uh, rapid renewal uh, represents an opportunity to uh, pay your excise tax and renew your uh, registration online 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. 
from anywhere in the world that has internet access as long as uh, your town is a participating town. And we began this uh, very exciting program with 10 municipalities working in a pilot. Uh, and uh, this spring, uh, we began to expand that based on our successful uh, response. We uh, extended that now to other municipalities. Cape Elizabeth was, was one of the first stand, standing in line to uh, inquire and, and attempt to take advantage of that. And so we can commend you and congratulate your leadership to consider uh, this particular service uh, really on the cutting edge for a service on behalf of your constituents once again. Uh, it will look like a complicated process behind the scenes, but it's very, very easy for the user, and that's one of the real benefits. It uh, lends itself well to a internet-based application because everyone in the state has to renew their registration at least once a year. Uh, and to date, so far, not all the municipalities are open 24 hours, and so it does help in a variety of different ways in terms of offering that service. Uh, um, Deb mentioned Shea Robbins, who's here with uh, the Information Resource of Maine. They are our, our private partner in the state, and they were established in 1998 by an act of the legislature to assist, assist agencies like ours to provide internet-based applications and, and develop solutions uh, on behalf of us, uh, our branch of state government. And uh, this represents our ninth online service. Two years ago, we had none, but now we're trying to catch up, catch up with uh, the expectations of our uh, citizens of the state, and we're currently leading state government with the, the numbers of applications we have. Just want to take a minute to talk a little bit about um, uh, where we're coming with some statistics here. I think you'll find this is uh, particularly relevant. It took um, 38 years for radio to connect to 30% of the American population. The television networks did that uh, in that same penetration of saturation in 17 years. And the internet or the web has done it in seven years. And so you're talking about a new medium that's really dramatic, it's very fast moving, uh, and the acceptance is what's most dramatic, I think, for people. Here's some statistics for the state of Maine. Uh, based on some recent surveys, as well as the state planning office information, uh, they project that 60% of uh, Maine people have a personal computer in their home. Of those, 85% are connected to the internet, so if you extrapolate that, about 51%, half the population, half the homes, are now connected to the internet at home. That's a dramatic increase just in the last couple of years. Email. Uh, this is, these are figures from the U.S. Internet Council. They project that by the end of this year, half the population in the United States, 135 million people, will use email. And an interesting um, fact about in 1998, the U.S. Postal Service delivered 101 billion pieces of email, while 618 billion emails were sent, many to Cape Elizabeth, probably, during that same year. One other statistic uh, with regards to electronic commerce, uh, business to business, business to consumer. If you look at um, uh, 1999, $25 billion. But if you look just a few years down the road, 2004, the projection is $233 billion in electronic commerce. So we're really talking about a medium that the, our consumers, citizens of this state and nation, have embraced uh, as uh, something that they want to use. The confidence level is high. Uh, dramatic, dramatic uh, change. Here's a quote from the great race car driver, Mario, Mario Andretti. If it feels comfortable, it's probably because you're not going fast enough. <laughs> and I think for governments, or for businesses, and for a lot of other entities now, that's true. It's just how do you deal with this? The internet is going to change the relationship that people have with government uh, dramatically. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think it's going to uh, change it positively. Anybody who's, who's ever had to get an application or a credential or a permit knows that sometimes you don't always feel like you're in the same playing field when it comes to dealing with government. Uh, and this is going to be the great level up. Uh, the other thing that we've noticed is that our constituents don't seem to distinguish between state government, local government, and federal government often. It's just government, it's just services that they need, and they're looking for solutions to get it. If you look at the, what's happened over the internet just in the last three or four years, most sites began with publishing information where you'd read a newspaper article and they'd say, or a magazine, and say, check our website for more information. The second stage of development of the internet really dealt with the ability to inquire, to ask information. You could email for a copy of something, or email a copy for a form, or request information. The stage to where most governments are right now is this critical stage. It's the ability to actually transact business. Uh, some, the ability to uh, transact business, to get a credential, to get a license, to get whatever it is you need, to be able to pay for it online in an online transaction. Uh, that's kind of really kind of a key piece. 
uh, and then eventually where you get your value added to be able to integrate services where agencies uh, combine their offerings so that uh, a consumer only has to make one visit to be able to uh, get maybe several applications or several permits uh, and the burden isn't placed on the user and then eventually transforming uh, what it is that citizens want. We don't know what it's going to look like necessarily in a couple of years but uh, the technology is there to pull information that's available by state and local governments in a variety of different ways. We may find that consumers want to be able to pull information that looks more like this. Once again, they're not as concerned about their bank, uh, their uh, Department of Education, or the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. They're concerned about their money, their health, their education. Uh, so there are ways for them to personalize their own website at their business or home that might look something like this. And then if they were then to click to my car, this doesn't happen to be my car, but it'd be a nice one to be driving on the shore tonight. If I were to click my car, I could then pull state information with regards to my registration. How current is it? Can I renew it online? Uh, do I have any violations uh, that I need to worry about from a point? Is my insurance current? Uh, in some, some very busy communities actually have traffic cams at busy intersections where you can check the commute before you go home so you know which route to take. So there's a variety of mechanisms that are available. Uh, uh, information that's available and so the real key is we don't know what's going to look like this necessarily but what we're encouraging state agencies now is you need to start thinking like a, like a citizen, like a consumer when you present information, when you develop it. What are the, some of the building blocks that we've experienced just in the last couple of years? Uh, certainly in state government we know that privacy and security are key. If people are going to uh, pr provide information they want to make sure that that's going to be confidential uh, and, um, and, and that's uh, something that uh, should be automatic privacy statements, those things need to be available. Electronic payments, uh, if they're going to make a purchase online, obviously they're going to have to have some way to be able to pay for that. Uh, and um, uh, we're offering with this program the ability to use um, uh, credit cards and electronic checks. Uh, infrastructure, digital divide, we talk about this, we talk about the context of having the back end available uh, from, from many uh, uh, eight state agencies, but all, at the same time we're talking uh, about municipalities because so much of what we do as an agency uh, works uh, in partnership with municipalities whether it's voting or whether it's uh, motor vehicle registration it's really critical that that some of the municipalities in Maine that currently don't even have internet based or internet access get it so we can offer similar type services and always think of it thinking of it in an, as an enterprise-wide strategy uh, what we hope the, the benefits will be to the public 24 7 access to information uh, and the long lines at government offices and we know what the long lines are because we're the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and we know what we, we know what our goal is when we try to eliminate that. Um, we have too much paper uh, and then hopefully dealing with government entity will change from a hindrance to a convenience. Uh, once again, uh, the ent enterprise approach we talk about uh, when we encourage other state agencies to move in this direction is self-service models where citizens can do more of this online themselves. Uh, interagency uh, coordination, seamless application where the burden isn't on the user, uh, and, and then intergovernmental coordination as well. What I'd like to do now is just show you the, uh, the demo itself and as to how this will work. And um, um, the process, so once again, it's very complicated behind the scenes. It's, it's actually unique in the nation. This is one of the first intergovernmental e-commerce applications, not in Maine, but in the country, where an individual can um, uh, wor work between two levels of government, state and, and, and local in this circumstance, in a simple financial transaction, a, a, a simple e-commerce solution. Um, when there are two ways to get to the site, there'll be a link on your, web, on your, on your municipal website. This is also the state website, uh, beginning with kind of an uh, introductory um, uh, as to the program and uh, how the program works. Uh, you'll find right up front that if you wish to do this online, you will need the same thing you need to do it right now when you come into the town office. You need your current vehicle registration. You need your insurance card. You need to know your vehicle's current mileage. And you need some sort of uh, way to pay for this, and that would be a credit card or, in, in, in this municipality's circumstance, uh, electronic check. So once you're armed with that information and the, uh, the tools that you'll need, you get, get started. This is a demo once again, so it'll show, uh, typically, um, it will show those municipalities that are currently participating. Uh, this demo is a couple of months old, so I could pick Cape Elizabeth if it was up there, but even if I don't, it's going to go to Portland, so I'm going to just click it for the purpose of this demo. And it'll go to my town th that I've selected. And uh, 
the tutorial begins at this point, and we need to collect certain information. So we would ask them to look for on the registration, and the first thing we need is the control number. So we're actually circling where, where that control number appears on the registration, so they won't mistake that. And then right here where it says control number, you can type in uh, the various numbers. You then will continue. Uh, the second piece of information that they would be required to present uh, is their class code. And we list where the class code would appear right here. Um, there's a drop-down box here, because it could be conservation, could be an antique, uh, most typically it would be a passenger. Uh, so we'd I'll hit passenger, then click uh, continue. Uh, the third piece of information that we would look for, as you would at the town office, is uh, registration number. And that's located right here. Uh, and then we would type that registration number in, in this location, once again. And the final piece of information we need is, is the registrant. Uh, a, and in this circumstance, we give an example with two names where, where there's dual registration. And so that would be clicked in right in this area. Uh, and then hit continue. Based on the information, we then go through and check the 1.4 million registered vehicles in the state of Maine and pull uh, your current uh, registration. This particular registration, once again, for the purposes of this demo, is a Mr. Speedy Gonzalez from uh, Portland. And uh, this describes, uh, I'm assuming it's a he, uh, his car. And uh, there's a reference here as to whether this information is correct. The circumstance may be that you've moved within your town. And if that's the case, there's an opportunity to change your address uh, in your town and correct that. If you've actually, in fact, if you've actually moved to another municipality, your municipality would have to be participating in this program to be able to register and you'd get a notice uh, of that fact. But assuming it's correct, you hit yes. We then uh, have a breakdown of what your registration fees would be. And there's a breakdown as to what the local excise tax would be, the registration fees, agent fees, and the total fee. Uh, sometimes citizens have questions about excise tax, registration, uh, the agent fee. Uh, these are hooked up so you can click any, any one of these and uh, get information about what the excise tax is, goes to work for your municipality, stays within the municipality, uh, and uh, has some background information on that. Uh, assuming that you accept these figures and that this looks uh, appropriate, you then hit yes to go to the payment page. Uh, and then um, the first thing that you're required to do is provide insurance information, just like you would do in your municipality. Uh, there's a drop-down box here that lists all the insurance companies uh, in the state of Maine licensed to do business. And so you can simply uh, pick one of those, uh, fill in your policy number right here, work through that. You need your current odometer reading as well. Continue with that insurance information. You would then uh, go to your uh, credit card page. What this allows you to do at this time is fill in your credit card information. Uh, you're required by credit card companies to actually repeat your address. That's why it's duplicated here. But you simply fill that information in uh, with a couple clicks. Finally, uh, you have an option down here that allows you to, because some of our residents summer perhaps in, uh, I should say winter in a warmer climate, uh, if you wanted this particular registration you're doing online sent to Florida uh, or Arizona, you can uh, have that sent to a different address by clicking down here, assuming that it's going to be sent to the same address that's on the registration. Uh, you simply click at this point, and uh, then you get a confirmation page. <clears throat> at this point, you've actually completed, in just a few moments, your entire transaction. Uh, this confirmation page is a breakdown of your um, uh, your fees you paid and also recaptures your uh, information uh, with regards to registration. We've worked out an arrangement with, with the law enforcement community in Maine, both municipal and state police, so that uh, if you wait, in the unlikely event, you wait till midnight before your registration is due uh, and you decided, oh, I've got to get my car registered, you can actually do this at home. Um, you can then print out the, the confirmation sheet and that'll be proof that you've actually paid your registration. Your tags are then sent to you within four to five business days. So you're, you don't even have to make a trip to the town office anymore. It's that convenient from that context. And as a kind of a thank you, finally, uh, for doing this online, we have a little uh, piece down here that says, please remind me, remind me to re renew online next year. So you can click this uh, and uh, set up a reminder, an email reminder to be sent to you next year. Uh, and so assuming this is July, maybe a month before in June, you want to be reminded, submit that and you'll get a month early an email reminder that your registration is due. Uh, and so um, in just real, literally a few moments, um, you can go through this process. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a very, very exciting uh, program. 
uh, to offer uh, to date. Uh, we've had uh, growing participation in this program. Our best ambassadors to date have been those municipalities have already chosen to do it, uh, that were our pilot towns. Um, month of May, we had uh, 1,000 people in Maine register online. Uh, interestingly enough, 24% of those who registered online have done so on the weekend or on a holiday. Hmm. They've chosen to renew the registration when it was convenient for them. Uh, it's an application that lends itself very well to an online-based application. Uh, once again, everybody has to do it, uh, and uh, it uh, is a very easy, quick way to uh, uh, process uh, what is uh, a mundane activity for many people. Uh, but it's an exciting proposition. It's an exciting proposition. Uh, the um, application itself just won a national award from uh, uh, those who are familiar with Civic.com, which is a um, uh, municipal government technology uh, magazine. Just listed this as one of 50 top applications uh, for the last year, uh, and uh, we're very excited about uh, offering it. We do it in partnership with towns. Uh, it's important for us, uh, for a variety of reasons, to offer this. Uh, uh, we found that it takes redundancy out of the work for our own employees to a great extent, uh, but it has, as it will your employees, but it also offers the highest level of service for your constituents that you can possibly imagine, 24-7 uh, service. Uh, and so it has some very unique applications. The accounts and controls are uh, superb in terms of uh, uh, the processes that we've been able to put in place. We have worked with all the various vendors uh, that, uh, that offer this program uh, uh, to date, the electronic vendors. And we've just had some very, very good luck uh, with the program. So we're very excited about offering it. Uh, we're very excited that uh, Cape Elizabeth is uh, on the verge, hopefully, of considering uh, favorably uh, this application on behalf of your constituents. And I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have with regards to the application this evening. Yes, sir. A couple of questions for you, Dan. Sure. First, um, do you see down the road where the towns might be losing uh, the revenues they're now getting, the state just assuming the responsibility for doing this totally. And second, on the uh, insurance, what's to prevent me from logging in and saying my insur insurance expires six months from now when actually it expired six months ago? Sure. Well, there are two things. Um, and in terms of insurance, there is an existing state law that, that um, um, ensures that people have to, uh, have to provide the current insurance. If you do that, uh, you're liable and there are fines in place if, in fact, uh, you pretend you have insurance, or if you suggest you have insurance, then cancel it later on. Um, <clears throat> and that's all that's required under existing state law. That'll change in two years. The legislature has passed a law that requires automatic notification. Right now, under, under state law, we're not required to automatically sp suspend pending notification of uh, somebody's dropping insurance. But in the next two years, that's going to change with legislation that was passed this session. Those changes will also be incorporated in this program as well. Um, and so that'll, that'll be a phased in period. So it's on the honor system right now, but it, there is a, a substantial fine for uh, suggesting that you have insurance and, uh, uh, and not having it, particularly if you're found to be guilty. In terms of the um, cost for municipalities, the initial cost uh, uh, of significance is the loss of the agent fee. Uh, the towns are typically um, uh, benefited from an agent fee for providing that per transaction and it depends on the type of transaction, whether it's a renewal, first-time renewal, we're just dealing with renewals here, first-time registration or renewals, we're just dealing with this program with renewals. Um, and so uh, because the citizen is, is essentially doing it themselves, we're actually pulling information from the city, pulling from our databases, um, we didn't feel that it was fair to, to charge this, to, for service to charge a cost more than it typically would do now. So we wanted some incentive for people to be able to do this online. So that's the initial cost for municipalities. The second piece uh, is the same burden that we have to pay in the state right now, and that's we have to absorb the merchant fee on the credit card application. Uh, that will be an incentive, I think, for many municipalities to encourage the electronic checks because there's no merchant fee on the electronic check. It's, a, it's pennies per transaction, I believe. Shay, can you help me with that? It's 18 cents per transaction and inform the observes that. And so, uh, to the extent that municipalities are offering that as an option and people use that, um, I think that's going to be an advantage. In state government right now, as, for, as, a, as of July 1st of this year, all our agencies are required to accept credit cards for all our services. And so we're all coming to grips with that. We all think there should be a more favorable rate uh, our combined rate for the state now is 2.07 percent, the merchant rate that we all pay, uh, that we have to absorb as a municipality would be. That's the second piece uh, that towns need to factor in. Sorry for such a long answer. I'm still a recovering politician, and I'm trying to work my way through it, but uh, uh, eventually I'll get there. 
the, um, uh, the penetration points, I should say the saturation points, however, for most municipalities right now for this new application is about 7 or 8 percent. So about 7 or 8 percent statewide of those who are eligible to use it have used it. Uh, and uh, that will grow eventually as people become accustomed to this and feel more comfortable with the, with the application. Uh, and so there is, um, uh, our experience has been, and, and we, we've released this in towns as small as Joe Foxcroft recently, who come to grips and really dealt and used that money for a variety of other reasons other than just uh, the purchasing of, uh, of some services and or uh, to, to supplement or complement what they were currently paying uh, some of their staff. Uh, but they found that the trade-off is being able to offer 24-hour service. Uh, and uh, based on uh, the expenses you may lose or some costs that municipalities may lose on this side, they pick up on behalf of their constituents 24-hour service uh, in a very unique, easy application. Yes? Did, did I, I, I? I probably missed it. <laughs> I was learning how to use the computer while you were doing it. Um, so the state will then send uh, the little yellow in a, in a hard copy envelope, send it out to everybody? Absolutely, yep. The, the, the stickers themselves will be sent directly to the home within four to five business days. The stickers and then the, the applicate, the, the yellow, yep. the registration. Yeah, the registration slip itself. Yep. And is there a cost? There must be a cost associated with that. I mean, are we ahead or behind for the state? Well, it's just something we're going to absorb from that. Uh, it's like many other uh, uh, electronic or internet-based applications. Eventually, there'll be more and more cost savings for us as an agency to do it this way. There may not be initially, but eventually, uh, it's just gonna, it's gonna pay in the long run. So uh, that's a service and that's a cost that, that, that um, uh, we absorb at this point within our agency to send those out. The other marketing piece that uh, we've also committed to do, and I don't know if Cape Elizabeth does reminders right now, I don't believe that they do, is that uh, for those who are coming up for renewals, uh, we've agreed for a extended period of time to send notices out to those folks uh, uh, with a brochure about this particular program to let them know how it works uh, and where they can get information, uh, let them know that it's a partnership between the state and Cape Elizabeth, and uh, that's a commitment we've made in addition to uh, being here tonight and uh, working with Deb and other entities to uh, ensure uh, that a way to get the word out so people can actually become familiar with the service. Councillor Barry. Uh, um, I had a couple of questions. Yeah, no, uh, if uh, I have the VIN number underneath the uh, uh, windshield on the front of the dashboard of, an, of a motor vehicle, uh, well, passenger car, because uh, uh, big trucks and so forth have to, can't, have to do this in person. Yep. But uh, if I have the VIN, can I uh, then find out the name and address of the uh, registration of that vehicle? Uh, no, there, there are actually... Um, um, under the Driver Privacy Protection Act, there, there, there are a lot of provisions in place that don't allow citizens to access other names of uh, private information, I should say personal information, um, uh, their street address, uh, that various information. Uh, having said that, there are certain agencies that are exempt from that, certain law enforcement community, right. the insurance agencies are exempt from that. Uh, there are a variety of provisions under federal law that, that do allow access to that information. And that answers your question. And, uh, yeah, thank you. And, yep. and uh, as far as uh, mailing out, you say if you want to designate some address uh, to have the uh, registration mailed out to you, can you do it to a post office box? But oh, sure. I don't see I any think reason why not. Yeah. Your example was that uh, someone goes to uh, Arizona, Arizona or Florida or whatever. And, uh, yep. So you, a P.O. box in Phoenix, uh, you would sure. send it there. Sure. And uh, the SR-22 forms, the, the, the insurance forms uh, for uh, required for mandatory insurance. Uh, right now under this program, uh, to anticipate your question, if, if you are required to fill an SI-22, you can't take advantage of this program. So if you we cannot. have, you cannot right now. Oh. So if you are, if you did get picked up at some point without insurance, uh, that puts you in a different pocket of, so we've probably got a, a few, it's in the single of thousands of people who are, who, who are required to file an SI-22 for a period of three years. Right. And so if you uh, were required to file an SI-22, uh, or, or, if the machine, or if the computer matched that you were, you'd get a notice that you were unable to, to complete the transaction for that reason. I see. Yeah. And, and, and uh, the insurance company, you say, in a couple of years is going to have uh, instant shut off if the... Uh, yeah, it's been a kind of a raging debate for, in the legislature for 20 years, perhaps. Uh, uh, Councilwoman Lynch uh, can, uh, can testify to that. Uh, this has been an ongoing debate in the legislature about... Um, um, notification and what's interesting in Maine is that according to national statistics 
uh, we probably have less than uh, six percent uh, drivers who are uninsured at any given time. It's, this is an extrapolation from accident reports, uh, and they and they figure out who has insurance, who doesn't, and they extrapolate that on the entire state population. We're almost uh, we're number one or number two in the nation in terms of the lowest number of uninsured drivers, the number of uninsured drivers at any given moment, and yet there's always if. If, if the person that hits you is uninsured, it's pretty significant, even though the rate, even though the number may be low, uh, because of the financial consequences. And so the legislature has really looked hard at ways to try to make sure that there is some sort of automatic notification by the insurance industry to our agency, so we can take some sort of action. We haven't had um, the uh, computer systems uh, in terms of the, the entire database to do that. Uh, recently, we were giving some. Uh, appropriated some money to uh, migrate our computer systems, so we'll have the capacity within the next two years to do that. The legislature has asked us, to, and uh, in, uh, in that transition, in that migration, to include the functionality of being able to uh, collect that information from insurance companies uh, when somebody drops their insurance, so that would then kick out uh, a suspension notice to that individual. Uh, they would have, obviously, a right to a hearing, and there's a lot of due process that would be involved as well. But, That'll be the first time uh, that, that, that system works, and there'll be adjustments made in this program as well to compensate for that. How would you prove that the notice was received? Well, we'll get a bunch of uh, a, a legal people in a room, and we'll, we will <laughs> figure some way to, to do that. In terms, of, in terms of the individual that received it themselves, you mean? Uh, right. Yeah. The, the, the oh. license is suspended. Well, we have that issue now. Is, I mean, we, you know. Um, we do 69,000 suspensions a year right now. Uh, about 12,000 of those are, um, are um, out-of-state residents. And to my knowledge, we've never sent a notice to everybody because they always call me and said, I never got notice I was under suspension. But I'm kidding that's somewhat. But that, you're right. That's the issue that you always deal with. Uh, right. we, we send it to the most current address. Uh, and um, one advantage we'll have prospectively is that uh, one of the uh, advantages to migrating our computer system, right now we have we don't have what's called a relational database in our, in our state. We're tied to the state's bull mainframe. And so we have registration information, title information, and driver license information in separate databases. Part of this um, emerge is to have a relational database. And so at least every year, we're more likely to have more current information because as people renew their registrations, driver's licenses, on process, process of title, we're very likely to have more current information than we currently have. Sometimes information could be three, two or three, four years old. So. Finally, I was interested in your comment that you were a recovering politician. I was wondering if you could uh, uh, direct me to your support group. Well, I have, um, <laughs> my, uh, after 18 years in the legislature, my support group currently is my immediate family. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but counseling is going very well, and, uh, and we're working through it. So, I had a couple questions. Councilor McGinn. These may be more for Deb than for you. Um, what do we, have we anticipated what the revenue loss might be from this? <laughs> yes, Councillor McGinty, it's approximately $5,000. Uh, we, we estimate about a $3,000 loss uh, expense for credit card fees and about a $2,000 loss in agent fees. Okay. We don't take credit cards now, do we? No, we do not. But an awful lot of folks want frequent flyer miles, so we, we get <laughs> requested quite a bit. It's been a popular thing in our office for years because um, we've always had to pay the registration cash and uh, our experience has been uh, if they have to stand in line for a long time and they have to pay cash no matter how polite we are it's not it's not <laughs> enough uh, they're really looking for that convenience of being able to use a credit card or in this case an electronic check councilor lynch i just want to thank you and your staff and um, our own town clerk i think this is a great program i think our constituents are going to love it uh, it appears to be extremely user-friendly, and uh, I'm just really excited that Cape Elizabeth can participate in this, so thank you. Well, we're very proud, once again, of Cape Elizabeth's um, interest and inclination to move in this direction. It shows great leadership on your part to offer this on behalf of your constituents, and we're delighted to be able to do it. Our experience has been these, these can be complicated applications, but when we're able to work in partnership hand-in-hand -hand with municipalities, it really can make a difference. Councilor Roberts. Yeah, this question back to the town manager, I believe. Considering the, uh, I, this figure is probably based on what, the 7%? 10%. On 10%. It's based on 10% for the credit card fee, <coughs> and it's based actually a little higher than that for the uh, agent fees. But, okay, but this community obviously probably is much more computer literate and uses it perhaps a lot more than the statewide average would be. I'm putting on my finance chair hat at the moment, I guess. Uh, <laughs> 
this $5,000 figure, do you, how comfortable are you with that? Or could it theoretically go a lot higher than that as far as the revenue loss? My, my sense, Councilor Roberts, is it will go higher over time. But, you know, just as with every, any other business with credit card fees, it's a cost of doing business. And, you know, as motor vehicle expenses go up, you know, for, other than during times of recession, the excise tax uh, over the years has uh, far outstripped the rate of inflation. And the, the sense is, yes, this expense will be getting greater. But, you know, quite frankly, we're looking in the longer term of, of you know, providing all sorts of these types of uh, programs online so that we truly can provide services uh, 24-7 and in the ability to collect uh, revenues from citizens who choose uh, to pay them uh, at most any time. So it's a, it's, it's a small expense, but you're right. It's, it's probably an expense in some time in Cape Elizabeth's future is going to be in hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, because that's the, going to be the, the primary mode of payment in the future. Okay. Any other questions? Councillor Fritz. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused about how we're going to lose money. now. It, it, there's an agent fee that was listed there, and that's to cover the cost, and the state keeps that money if people register yeah, online. Our private party, Information Resource in Maine, would, 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 would collect that agent fee. Uh, they would receive the agent fee that traditionally would have gone to the town itself. Okay, so if people register online, they'll be charged that $2 fee, and if they register at our town hall as they do now, they Probably would not $3. have to pay the $3, fee? $3 in Cape Elizabeth. I think it would be a dollar more. Because so they're paying it now. Already. They're paying it now, but they're paying, if you go in person, they're going to pay, I think, a dollar more than they would do it online. They're paying more now at the town hall than if they did it online. Okay. In other words, the taxpayers are saving money. They're just paying this, this private company that's providing the service instead of the town. And they, they're getting it 50% less. So if the and town, so if the town, if they register at town hall, the town gets the three dollars. If they register online, the town gets zip. We do get all the the, the for the agent tax. for the agent, the agent fee. fee right. And then um, I'm just wondering how soon the town, since since the excise tax is, comes back to the town. Sure. How soon does the town get? that money. Yeah, How it's, not, it's, it's literally within 24 hours. What's been your experience, Shay? Is there it's something less than that? It's actually a little bit longer than that. The, um, for electronic checks and for credit cards, you have to go through a, a, a processing situation where the town will receive their money for something that's less than 24 hours. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's So then who gets the float? Who gets what? The float. <laughs> the float. The, the float. money that's earned <laughs> while it's sitting in somebody's bank account, there's interest. Oh. I don't have the answer to that, but I can get that information for you. Four days is quite a long time. I mean, when we have mm -hmm. um, instant online capability, why doesn't it come immediately? Well, I think that, once again, we're diverting money in two different directions, whether it's electronic check and credit cards. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very fair question. The bigger issue, eventually, I think, will be whether or not, once more people stop participating in this program, once the state gets the more leverage against these credit card companies, can we begin to ratchet down that merchant fee altogether? Uh, that's where they're making money, on every single transaction. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable to me that they have to charge even a negotiated rate, which is 2.07 percent right now for what we're getting for that service, uh, because uh, it's an electronic service. There's, there's no <laughs> rationale other than the fact that they can charge it that we're paying for it right now. So eventually, we hope, with electronic checks, we'll begin, begin to find some mechanism where we have some leverage. I don't want to make it sound like we're, we're in a competition with the, with, with the credit card companies, but to some extent, we are. And we may find that uh, that fee, that merchant fee, that, that really is so onerous right now, begins to drop in the long run. Uh, much like um, uh, we've seen uh, businesses and other entities begin to use email instead of first-class mail. Uh, if you look at, remember those statistics for 1988 with the U.S. Postal Service, the reason the Postal Service is having issues now is because more and more people are using email as an accepted way to communicate. Uh, and uh, I think there are going to be some cost savings and, and some efficiencies with electronic checks that's going to have a, a similar impact uh, on credit card companies. I think they're going to have to make some concession to what's happening with the leveraging.
le leveraging of these monies. They don't have to yet, because once again, we only have a few municipalities that are involved and a few agencies of state government that are doing it, but eventually I hope that there is an avenue there to, to leverage those issues and to get a more favorable rate. Councilor Carson. I, it's the first time I've sat over here in this corner for a long time, so I wasn't able to hear Councilor Barry. Did you ask for when uh, the, it's the courts, right, that suspend licenses? I mean, the police do the thing, and then the courts suspend the licenses. But and then the courts, did Secretary you ask? Secretary of State also does. Well, we administratively would, if, if, if it's a court audit, we would administratively take action. We also have authority to suspend uh, based on, on an administrative body of law. So the court system sends up to the state and says the following licenses were suspended or something like that. So in between that time, somebody could, of course, manage to get their car registered. And it doesn't make any difference, I guess, if you have a suspended license. You can still register your car, though, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Somebody else can drive it. Yeah. Councilor right. Lynch. Just getting back to that merchant fee, have you considered perhaps offering a discount of, say, 1%? for electronic check transactions where you would still end up ahead by a percentage point <clears throat> over um, credit cards so that you would actually be encouraging users to go on and pay in, a, in an electronic check format? Well, we're willing to work with municipalities to do a variety of marketing uh, and consumer awareness issues in that format. And Shay may be able to comment on this as well, but once again, uh, the concept of electronic check is you, is you simply, you're, you're putting in a routing number, so you're just withdrawing money out of your own account. It's a very easy way to do it, very convenient way to do it. They can't take any more money out of there than you have in your account. That's going to be very appealing to many citizens, to many residents, once they begin to feel comfortable with that. If you look at those business-to-consumer statistics I showed you earlier, consumers are accepting this as, as, as an acceptable way to, to do business. And offering them an alternative now may be the answer in many instances. Uh, but we've got to do some leveraging here to be able to, to, to have an impact uh, over the long run. We're okay right now because uh, the, the, pen, the saturation points aren't that dramatic. Although, even at 7 to 9 percent, uh, I'm told that that's twice the national average for a new internet-based application, which is typically around 2 or 3 percent in terms of usage. So this is a service that's going to take off uh, eventually, and people will be more accustomed. There will still be citizens in Cape Elizabeth who are going to prefer to come in conventionally, traditionally, uh, and register their vehicles like they've always done it. And that's, that's outstanding. That's great. Uh, what, we, what we found in many instances is that uh, allowing for some of those numbers to be siphoned off allows uh, your busy clerks and officials, you know, even maybe a little bit more time to handle that, those same individuals who prefer a traditional or conventional way of getting service uh, uh, than they would have had otherwise. And so it may take some of the sting out of being able to offer a little bit higher level of service that they were unable to do otherwise. Any further questions, comments from the council? Thank you very much. You've Thank done you an excellent much. job of explaining Appreciate the program. It. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, Madam Councilor. Chairman. Yes, Councillor Carson. I move that the uh, council authorize the manager and the town, town clerk to uh, participate in the rapid renewal program of the state of Maine. Do I hear a second? A second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I wonder if SOS is an ominous, <laughs> you know, SOS.org, is that? <laughs> I, I know where you got it, but still. <laughs> Any, yes, Jack. <laughs> Just one uh, question of either Mike or Deb. Have we had many citizens requesting the service? I don't even know about it yet. Do they? We, yeah, do they know? we have had more folks inquire about this service, and I think perhaps it's because they may have family or friends in other communities that, you know, were part of the pilot program. Hmm. Um, I can tell you that we have had folks that did not care to um, participate in the beta testing program because they frankly wanted to come to town hall. And that's a good thing, you know, that really is a, is a positive thing. Um, we have had several folks express, when we told them about rapid renewal, um, their interest in having their registration sent to their child, you know, in graduate school in California, whatever. I mean, literally those folks, you know, so they're starting to think of those things and the benefits. So, you know, I anticipate increase. But, you know, folks have, you know, slowly started to ask about that. And the credit card is a huge 
plus to many folks. Yeah. I hate to see the loss of the revenues, but I agree with the statement was made earlier. I think the citizens are going to expect that kind of a service, so I will vote for it. <clears throat> I, I just would encourage the Secretary of State and the town clerks to try and explore some way to level the playing field so that we're encouraging people to use checks and then we can avoid that loss of revenue. I know my tendency would be to use a credit card to get the frequent flyer miles and I wouldn't recognize that you're losing 2% on that transaction and that the towns are going to. So if we can somehow come up with a way economically to encourage folks to pay by check, um, I think that will um, be a benefit to um, both the user and uh, the agencies involved. But I will be supporting the program. Any further discussion? It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Janet says she'll get off my back now, too. <laughs> <laughs> she won't ask me again, but it'll be She does an excellent job for the town, so. OK, item number 21, a re request from the developers of Christina's Woods. Mr. Manager, would you like to yes. elucidate? Yeah, I received a phone call today from uh, the person who has a contract to purchase, uh, Christina Woods. And there's some minor issue, or could be major issue, but some question about a deed that they have that, that is a little bit unclear. So they have asked for this to be tabled uh, to, a, to an uncertain time uh, pending uh, when that issue is squared away. I would move that this be tabled. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Or? I don't know. Well, I, guess I don't have any discussion about the tabling, but just a comment for the next time it comes up. Um, so I can take that up after. Um, or you can take it up now. Oh, OK. Well, I, I, I thought we were lacking some information. I don't know if they were going to be coming with information about I mean, I don't know what South Portland's ordinances are like for stormwater control. Um, I don't know anything about the land, where it is, what the contours are, whether they have other options. And um, I guess when they come again, I'd like to see some of that kind of information. They were going to bring all that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? OK. We've got a motion to table it, and it was seconded. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Um, item number 22. It's action on a report from the planning board having to do with um, historic preservation. We have it before us. Yes, Madam Chairman, Henry? I was. Uh, Chairman of that committee, and uh, I would like to uh, move that the council adopt the recommendation of the planning board. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Just, just if I might, Madam Chairman, for elucidation of the public record, the planning board had recommended that the council not delete uh, the provisions, and it was a unanimous vote. Thank you. There is some question of. Uh, uh, which uh, properties should be on the list, but that is a matter with, that could be dealt with at a later time. But uh, at this time, I think it's not appropriate to eliminate the 45 degree, the 45 day uh, period altogether. All right. Any Councilor Fritz? I'd just like to comment that I, I appreciate the, you know, the way the planning board dealt with um, the issue. I think they looked at it very thoroughly and, and appreciate the recommendation. Great. I'm sure we all echo that. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? It's been moved, seconded. All those in favor? It's unanimous. 7-0. OK. Um, <clears throat> item number 23 has to do with a uh, recommendation regarding transferring funds from the Fort Williams Trust Fund to the Char Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. Mr. Manager? Yes. When the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation was established, it was 
I believe everyone understood to be the successor to the Fort Williams Trust. The Fort Williams Trust was simply a town uh, entity. It wasn't a separate 501c3. It had certain limited uh, purposes. The Fort Williams Charitable Foundation is an independent 501c3. The initial board was appointed by the town council, but it's independent. Uh, the amount of funds that would appear to be in the Fort Williams Trust, without going into all the details, is $18,442.54. Uh, I would recommend that that be transferred from the Fort Williams Park Trust and the Fort Williams Capital Fund, where some of it is, as the memo explains, uh, to the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation as soon as we have confirmation uh, that they're ready to accept the check. Thank you. Or electronic payment thereof. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do I hear a motion? Mm. I'll move that the, the funds. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Berry. Well, can always well, count on you. Again, yeah. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion, comments, questions? Hearing none. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, just, I'm sorry. Just a quick Councilor question. Barry? I just want to confirm. The Internal Revenue Service has approved the, the uh, 501c3 uh, uh, designation of the rating for this. And That's correct. Uh, right. Okay. Just want to confirm that. Thank you. No further discussion. No. Uh, let's move the question. All those in favor of donating the 18,442.54 cents? It's unanimous. Seven zero. Yeah, it's transferring. 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 Transferring, not a donation. No, I'm sorry. I misspoke. Thank you, Councillor Fritz. <laughs> okay. Um, item number 23. Four. 24. Four. Thank you. I'm getting behind myself here. Um, proposed carry forward balances be carried forward into fiscal year 2002. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer questions on any of these. Uh, and I, I did, uh, I was debating the amount on one particular one because, and then I forgot to put it on the list entirely, which was the GIS account, uh, the Geographic Information System. Mm -hmm. And it, what it, it was in eight, that it was between 8,000 and 9,000. And it was, it, the problem was, it was like $8,517, whatever it was left in the account, but the department only had about 8,200 left in it. So I didn't want to overspend the, the, the whole account. So I'd recommend you add GIS or General Geographic Information Systems to the list uh, in the amount of 8,000, which will ensure that that particular department is not going to deficit for the year ended uh, June 30. And I'd be happy to answer questions on any of these. Councillor Berry. I, I would move that the, uh, the proposed carry forward balances as amended by the additional $8,000 for geographical information system uh, be carried forward. Second. I moved and seconded. The dugout fund, like where's that for? A field. That is for Holman Field and Papano Field. They've, they've been donated funds and they, they need more funds. And I've just got a letter recently from them that uh, Charles Chase Company has donated uh, all of the uh, concrete for that project. And a, a brick company uh, out in Gorham has agreed to donate all of the brick. So uh, it's, uh, it's really going along well. The amount, by the way, is how much is it? Uh, 4,050 in cash in the fund as well. Any more questions, comments? Hearing none, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? 7-0, we're on a roll. Item number 25, a request for a quick claim deed. Is there anything you want to say about this, Mr. McGovern, or not? Deborah. Or, or Deborah? Thank you very much. On June 8th, the town did foreclose on this property at 34 Longfellow Drive for an unpaid sewer lien. I, subsequent to the foreclosure, was in contact with the mortgage company, Chase Manhattan, who um, has requested that the town assign a quick claim deed back to the previous owner, as Chase has an interest in the property. They have submitted a check to the town for all past and current sewer due to the town, current property taxes, and a couple of miscellaneous fees, a quick claim recording, and so forth. So if it is the desire um, of the council to quit claim this back, uh, I have 
attach to your um, material this evening a copy of the quick claim deed that would be <coughs> filed in the Cumberland County Registry. Thank Madam, you. I have a question, a couple of questions. Uh, is this uh, reading sort of between the lines? Is is this uh, a, 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 the uh, Chase Manhattan wants to uh, eliminate the lien so that they can foreclose? Is it what's going on? There? <laughs> I believe they because the wish to regain comes. their interest back so that if to, any to, because the town lien comes ahead of their mortgage and priority, correct. and that's a specific so question they their attorney asked of us. So yes. Uh, uh, my second question is a uh, couple of questions. Just on the form of the deed itself, um, it, 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 uh, in the first line, shouldn't you say it does hereby release two? Um, just to use a, uh, it says the, the town of Cape Elizabeth release or change it to releases to make it tense friendly. Oh. And on the bottom, uh, where it says the town have, uh, don't you put it in witness whereof in the usual deed form, the town of Cape Elizabeth has caused this instrument to be, to be signed in its corporate name and sealed with its corporate seal. I know seals have been abolished by statute, but don't we usually put the town seal on a, a document? Absolutely. Anything that we file, whether it's a lien or a release or what have you, yeah. you do use the embossed seal of the town and of the notary witnessing the signature. So, well, if you, if you put the uh, signed in its corporate name and sealed with its corporate seal by the town name, you put that language in the deed. I understand that's picky, but uh, I think it's appropriate for them. I'm completely clueless on this issue, so. <laughs> Councilor Roberts. What type of interest do we get on these unpaid sewer bills in the interim when they're not being paid? Uh, under, under, the, uh, Title. under the state law, it's the same amount as you set for property taxes, so it, currently it's 10.5%. Thank you. 10.5 or 10? 10, 10, 10 even. We'll change. I would move that we provide the quit claim deed back as requested. Second. Oh, okay, we've got two. Henry seconded with in the appropriate form. That's, that's fine. That's fine. I'll withdraw okay. my second. Fine. Fine. Just so they match up. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further questions? Mr. I, I did have a question, but I just wanted to use this opportunity, as I sometimes do, uh, when, when there's a moment I can seize it. Uh, Deborah Lane went to the Registry of Deeds this morning. Uh, to file the tax liens for the, the taxes that were due last year. And we, I think there was over 15, about 15, almost $15 million billed in real estate taxes. And the amount that was liened was 35 tax liens out of over 4,000 accounts and about $90,000, which is absolutely remarkable in terms of the fact that citizens paid their taxes. Uh, promptness and paying uh, their debts due to the town, as well as the, the work of all the people involved in the tax collection efforts for the community. Uh